Good morning. Chris said it's time to go. He's going to start putting a clock up there on the screen that says it's got a countdown, and so we'll be here. In Psalms 95, 1 through 3, it says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving Make a joyful noise unto him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. That tells us no matter what, when we come into this house, we're only here to worship God, Amen. sing praises unto him. Amen. Last night I was <clears throat> I was looking at these hymns and and I pulling up a little bit of history and we all are familiar with Fanny Crosby you know she wrote over 8,000 of our hymns that we that are popular today during her lifetime when she was only six weeks old a poorly trained doctor applied some plaster to her eyes rendering her totally blind at six weeks old I didn't know that even in her childhood, she realized she had a special gift. She often said she had a jewel, that being contentment. At age nine, she wrote this poem. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't, to weep and sigh because I'm blind. I cannot and I won't. She was saying, I'm going to praise my Lord no matter what. Let's stand this morning and sing one of those hymns that she wrote, Blessed Assurance.
Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to Calvary Baptist Church this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you for this time, Lord, just to be in your house, and Lord, just to worship you. Father, how we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son to die on an old cross, Lord, to cover our sin. And Father, we pray this morning, if there's one here this morning that don't know you, that's never made that change. Father, we pray today's the day of salvation. Father, we just ask you to hide Brother Jeff behind the cross, Lord. Lord, just give him the words to speak that will reach our hearts. Father, we pray that you'll just clear our minds of the day's activities and the things we got planned. And Father, that we can take this hour and just focus on you. Forgive us of our sin, Lord, and our shortcoming. Bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We want to welcome everybody this morning. Y'all are sounding good in our song service. Uh, we'd like to ask you to silent or turn off your cell device at this time. We don't want interruptions during our services. Uh, we have one birthday this coming week to Carla Huddleston. I can't even pronounce that. But it may, Miss Carla. Uh, fifth Sunday scene coming up the 31st. Uh, please be sure and get a hold of Randy and get your name on the list if you would be interested in singing in our fifth Sunday sing. Uh, mission conference is right around the corner, guys. I believe there's some sign-up sheets out there on the resource table. Uh, if you can help in any way, please pick up one of them and get signed up and get them turned in so we can be sure and have a very, very successful conference this year. Amen. Y'all, let's just get together this morning, and as Brother Randy said, and let's just worship Him in song. The Scripture tells us to lift our voice to God in song and Him. And let's just do that this morning. Let's get our hearts ready for the preaching hour. Hymn number 504, He Touched Me.
Common thread this morning, Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And when he touched me, when he saved me, he touched me. Let's stand as we sing, since Jesus came into my heart. This is off to again.
hope you can sing that this morning since Jesus came into my heart. Thank you for that, Brother Randy. Number 462, hymn number 462, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. talked about <clears throat> the stuff in the throats and everything so this 
heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and the night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from Standing is mine, and the transaction so quickly was made. When as a sinner I came, took of the offer of grace, and it offered He paid me, oh, praise His dear name. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. Sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I have hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. That wonderful day when at the cross I believed, rich is eternal and blessed, supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away. Was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Thank you, guys. We'll begin in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, as we stand, as we honor the word this morning. Mark chapter 5. If you have that, notice verse number 20. Mark chapter 5 and verse number 20. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. As you take this verse and just look at it, that might not make much sense to you. But as you are going to learn a history lesson this morning, we're going to pull some things together for you that hopefully, here in just a few short minutes, uh, some of these things and stories that you've heard might make a lot more sense to you. I love to see the Word of God in action, and I love to learn new things about God and His precious, precious Bible. And certainly in the last couple of weeks I've done so. And I wanted to share this with you that uh, hopefully you can get a new truth as, as well. Before we do anything else, I just think it'd be good if we would just pause a moment and allow the Lord to work in our heart. Miss Janice, would you come? Let's just softly think about where we need to be. And let's just get our hearts prepared. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to stand in the pulpit and preach again the Word of God, knowing, Lord, that no man is worthy to open and and to discuss and to preach your truth outside of your divine help and enablement. Father, I just plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this message. I, Father, that every syllable, everything that will be spoken today will honor you. And, Father, I pray that we'll lift you up as a song service is already done. Lord, I just ask that you would give me my 
my thoughts that I need to speak. And Lord, that, that you would hide anything from me that does not need to be spoken. Father, these people have worked hard all week. Many are tired in spirit and body. And Father, they need a truth. They need something, Lord, that they can hang on to to help them in their everyday life. And I pray, Father, this message will do that thing. Father, again, we love you and we thank you for what you've done and going to do in this service. Father, I pray that you'll pour out your divine power upon us. And Lord, let us see you clearly, more so than we ever have. Thank you, Lord, in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. We understand this, that anything that Jesus did or any place that Jesus visited is noteworthy. And such a place is in our text verse. The place is called Decapolis. It is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. Jesus visits De Decapolis to help us understand some special aspects of his earthly ministry. Actually, Decapolis was known for ten cities. So Decapolis is just kind of the main capital, if you would, but it also encompasses ten cities. It was founded by a Greek settler and some soldiers. These cities were sections of the Roman, of the, of the Roman Empire of Alexander the Great that he divided among his generals after his death. Much of the history of Decapolis actually comprised more than the ten cities. Many of the cities, if you are a Bible reader, are familiar to you. Cities such as Damascus, Philadelphia, Gardea, and others made up these ten city regions. These cities, while joined in a league by the Romans to control the trade routes and to provide protection, but the Romans also gave this area a certain amount of local control. They minted their own coins, and they ruled pretty much so their own affairs. Alexander the Great wanted the whole world to be under the influence of the Greek culture. He died before he could actually make that happen. And much of the known world, including many in Israel, now get this, this is where the story changes, many in Israel started adopting the Greek ways. Greek culture was established in many cities back then and including Jerusalem. Theaters became popular, but the rabbis of Israel forbid an attendance because many of the dramas portrayed in those theaters portrayed the myths of the Greek and the Roman gods. Gymnasiums appeared in the in many cities, including Jerusalem, not far from the temple. In these gymnasiums, training of bodies and minds was put into practice. Students studied philosophy of classical Greek. They received athletic training. Well, I'll say this as gently as I can. But many of that training took place that those people that would under go those training in those athletic events would do so unclothed. The Greek educational system was effective teaching ideas into the generations of Jewish children. Now everybody look up here, just smile like you're interested. Look, the reason this is important, because the devil was trying to pollute the Jewish culture. And this Greek culture was so, was, was, was so opposed to the things of God, and we're fixing to see that. Now, they started bringing all of this Greek culture to the young Jewish children. And the youth learned how to draw, sculpt, while often creating Greek gods. Because Greek mythology offered heroes and role models who competed with their Jewish ancestors. The Pharisees tried to keep the youth devoted to the Torah and tried to keep them away from the Greek culture. Is everybody so far with me? Temples were built to honor the local gods, and festivals were held to create the pagan holidays. The faithful Jewish population struggled to maintain their beliefs. People from small villages of Galilee had to enjoy the marble streets, the mosaic floors, and the running water, and the beautiful fountains. The common language at the time was Greek, of much of the known world. The Herods did try to give the Jews some things to pacify them, like their own stadiums and their own theaters. The Decapolis cities were satisfied with freedom under the Roman authority. They could enjoy their Greek practices, things like sacrificing in their temples to eating pork. Rome provided support for cultural practices and helped resist the outdated worldviews of the Jews. One of the most significant of the Decapolis cities was a place known as H-I-P-P-O-S, it said high on the hill, 
and could be seen across the Sea of Galilee by the fishermen of Capernaum and to other villages. Ironically, this area would be become a vital center of the early church. The culture was known as Hellenism. Write that down. This culture that we're talking about was known as Hellenism. Those who lived under Greek culture and the Roman Empire. The culture glorified human beings above other creatures and portrayed the human body as the ultimate in physical beauty. Hellenism's values were seen in the gymnasiums, the education, and the theaters and the arenas. The temples were places that was known as places, listen to this, the temples were places that was known as places of glorified pleasure, nothing more than the excesses of the body that you can just imagine. So you can imagine how the religious Jews of Galilee was struggling under this Greek influence. Is everybody with me so far? The early church had to struggle with the glorification of sexuality and violence, wealth, and all the forms of pleasure the human mind could draw up. In the process of struggling against this seductive power, some Christians decided to escape and to develop kind of their own small communities and, and their own small communes, simply because this culture was was perverted at the best. And the reason I bring that out is because we are sinking into this same abyss right now. We are seeing this same very thing that's happening while we are trying to maintain our Christian values our government is slowly but surely trying to wipe the vestige of Christianity off the face of the map. They do not want churches to be operating as as as, as we know today. They w- it it would make them little difference if any gospel preaching churches went out today. And by the way, and let me tell you from the outside, the devil hates this church as much as he hates anything else. And I will submit to you this morning, it's because if you're a member here of this church, guess what? If he hates this church, then he automatically hates you. He does not want you to learn, he does not want you to understand, and he does not want you to care about this message that you're fixing to hear. Now let me point and, and and pull some pieces of the New Testament together that maybe will help you understand. Are you ready? What you're about to hear is something that uh, maybe will help you appreciate these stories more than just you've heard in the past. So let me invite you to Mark chapter 4, verse 37, and you'll see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Now, I just want to bypass this. I'm not going to go into detail about this story because you're you're very, very familiar with this, but it does set us up for what we're going to be speaking about here in just a few short moments. Mark chapter 4, verse number 37 says it this way, And there arose a great storm of wind. Uh, by the way, we kind of sort of know what that's about. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow. And they awake him and saith unto him, Master, carest not that thou we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and uh, there was a great calm. And certainly we understand that Jesus knew exactly what was going on and, and what would occur and what his purpose was. But it's entirely possible before Jesus ever arrived at Decapolis, those ten cities, the devil tried to stop him. Now, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. No, everybody look. Everybody look. Come on. Everybody look. Jesus was on his way to this Decapolis, this ten city area. And can I tell you, this was the hotbed of satanic activity. So Jesus and his disciples get into this ship, and so guess what the devil decided to do? Come on. The devil decided to do and do something like this. Hey, what if Jesus, the devil's thinking, what if Jesus goes into my area? Is anybody listening? What if Jesus goes into my area and what if he starts messing around with my people 
And what if Jesus touches somebody? And what if there's a revival breaking out there? So here's what I'm going to do, the devil says. I'm going to get Jesus on that boat, and I'm just going to sink him and the disciples. Now, wait a minute. Does it start, start, start this make, make a little bit more sense to you now? See, we've always just thought this story was Jesus gets on the boat, he's asleep, and boom, everything's cool. Now, wait a minute. There was a purpose for that. There was a purpose for this. The devil understood this, that Jesus had his face to go to certain areas, and maybe maybe Satan under, didn't understand the mind of Christ like, like we understand it now reading in the New Testament, but Jesus was inching closer and closer and closer to a hotbed of satanic activity, and the devil says, I can't have that. So the next best thing for me to do is get some things stirred up. And you know what? The same truth provides to you today. To do. If you start getting close to God, guess what the devil's going to do? He's going to say, look, Kaylin is getting too close to God. I'm going to get some things stirred up in her life. Miss Bernie act like she likes to preach it. So I'm going to get some things stirred up in her life. Carla is... Co- well, I don't want to go there. People are trying to get saved and people are trying to get their lives in order. And, 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 and the church is trying to make a difference. So in order for that not to happen, I'll just stir some things up. And can I tell you this? Satan's been in the stirring up game for a long time. And listen, if you don't think that happens today, just follow me for a week. Friend, I want to tell you, He hates everything we stand for. So Jesus and his disciples is on this boat and, and all of a sudden, out of, watch this, watch this, out of nowhere, this storm comes. Why did this storm come at this particular junction? Well, preacher, the storm came because, but Jesus is going to teach them a lesson. Well, certainly he wanted to teach them a lesson, but I think the deeper lesson was Satan was trying to stop Jesus from getting into his area. Watch this. Mark chapter 4, verse 37. And there rose a great storm of wind. Now watch this. And the waves beat into the ship. Now I don't have a great lot of mental acuity, but here's what I understand. If the waves beat into the ship, I'm just figuring there's water in the ship. The Bible says a great storm of wind. Now, we understand all of this. Now, watch this. The boat was filling up with water. And this is not just some kind of kitty story and the Lord doing another miracle. This is a story of Jesus having his eyes on the goal and knowing that he was going to go to a place that was nothing but a storm that was brewing into Capitalist. And Jesus knew about storms. But I think, watch this, watch this. This is so good. This is so good. Jesus says, look, there may be a storm brewing on the sea, but there is a bigger storm brewing in Decapolis. And I'm going to, watch this, I'm going to make a difference here, and I'm going to teach this men that I can calm any storm. Now, I'm not talking about just on the water. I'm talking about in people's lives. There is somebody that came into this room this morning. You've had a storm brewing around you for some time. And you just, you just are consumed with it. Preacher, this is this, 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 this. Can I tell you this? You need to understand this morning that there is somebody that is good of calming your storms. Amen. So we see the waters beating into the ship and we see all of this going on here. Now the winds were pushing against the ship and panic was seen on the faces of the disciples and Satan was enjoying causing all of this havoc. Anything to keep Jesus away. Mark 4, 39. Let me hurry. And he arose, talking about Jesus, and rebuked the wind and said basically this, Peace! Now, wait a minute. I think I'm the only one that appreciated that. And here's what I mean by that. 
there was a source of the problem. And the source of the problem that Jesus diagnosed, watch, watch, was the wind. Well, preacher, I know that. I just saw that. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If the source of the problem is the wind, Jesus is getting to the source of the problem. Yeah. The reason this is so good is because the reason why you keep repeating those same mistakes is because you're not getting to the source of your issues. You're dancing all around it. Well, it's her, it's him, it's them, it's me, it's them, it's never me, it's I, I, I just, I, wait a minute. If you're ever going to have peace in your life, beloved, you're going to have to find the source of the issue and let the Prince of Peace get this out of your heart. Is anybody, is it, are we getting this? And I started thinking about this. Jesus, the wind was causing the problem. So Jesus didn't stand, stand up in the boat and say, peace be unto the pigs. The pigs at that time wasn't the problem. It was the winds. So Jesus is teaching us a lesson. Friend, listen, we've got to get to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem may be your bitterness. The root of the problem may be your attitude. The root of the problem may be a host of other things that you refuse to deal with. And because you refuse to deal with it, you play these things over and over and over and over and over in your mind. And you've got the most stinking thinking I've ever seen in my life. Jesus saying, I can... And I will, and I would love to give you peace. Oh, but preacher, you don't know my situation, and it's not that simple, and you make it sound so simple, and all I've got to do is wiggle my ears and my toes, and I'm okay. No, I didn't say that. But I am telling you this. A lot of people hang on to their problems because they love to hang on to their problems. Because if they got all those problems out of their life, then they wouldn't have nothing to gripe about. Then they wouldn't have nothing to be upset about. Then they would have to go on and make a productive citizen out of their life. Well, God forbid that. Then, once you get all this out, then you could start fulfilling God's role for your life. Now, maybe I'm just one of those, I was going to say this, and Judy don't have to amen this, but... Maybe I'm just one of those odd guys that I just don't like a lot of drama. But today, people invite that. Have you ever noticed this? The more drama people can get into, the more they like it and they hold on to it. But preacher, this is this, this, that, that, that. And it's affecting your attitude. Nobody wants to be around you. And, and it's all of this. Friend, I want to tell you this. When Jesus got into that boat, let me just give you a preview of coming attractions. He knew what was happening. The devil says... He's getting closer and closer and closer to me. And I can't have it. I'm going to try to destroy him. I'm going to try to get him in that boat. And when I get him in that boat, I'm going to sink him. I'm going to kill him. I hate him. You think Jesus was too awfully worried about that? You understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be cute. You think he was too worried about that? Let me show you how worried he was about it. He was asleep. This is good. Now, some of you walked in here and you got sleep light on your face and you got wrinkles and you kind of got your breakfast cereal out of your... And you know why? It's because it's been a long time since you've rested in the provision of God. You see, my God wants to give me peace. Peace. So Jesus was so, so worried about it that he was sleeping through the storms and his disciples were so bent out of shape that they says, Hey! Well, maybe they didn't say it like that, but I would imagine it was close. The Bible says they had to wake him up. And then Jesus rebuked the winds. Here is my point for you. If you want to be set free, it's time for you to start rebuking some of those sins in your life and to get that filth out. Amen. Quit trying to play with it every week.
Quit trying to mold it into something that you think will be comfortable. Well, preacher, if I just have this particular sin, it's not as bad as yours. I can hold on to this and I can still be a function. No, you can't. That's a lie of the devil. And he wants you to be so wound up. And the devil says, I'm going to get him on the boat. Jesus rebuked the wind. He rebuked the problem. And the devil had no footing. That, my friend, is a key to you. If you ever want to be set free, it's time for some of our Christians in this room to start rebuking some of that filth you've led in your life and saying, I want and desire peace. Amen? Amen. Mark 4.41 says, they ask this, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea can obey him? I love that. That's classic. That's traditional good New Testament theology. They were amazed what Christ could do. Why are we amazed? He wants to bless your life. He wants for you to walk with Him and talk with Him. He desires for you to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that you, my friend, can be an effective witness for Him. Amen, preacher. Remember, all that Decapolis had in those ten cities was nothing but filth and nothing but sin and nothing but a big, big, big place of satanic activity. Jesus got on the boat. Satan wanted to sink that boat. But I thought something else was neat. Are you ready for this? Watch this. Watch this. You've got... Get, keep, keep your Bibles open because look at Mark 5.2. Mark 5.2. Are you there? Now watch this. By the way, can I tell you that chapter divisions kind of break the flow sometimes of Scripture? This is man's invention, chapter division and verses, all right? So usually just a one continuous story. And this kind of breaks the flow. Look what it says here. And when he was come out of the ship, look at this next word, immediately. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was Satan trying to do all ago? He's trying to sink the boat, right? So he said this. Mm. Jesus got into Decapolis. Jesus got into my area. Here's what I'm going to do. Immediately there came a man, a man of old tombs. A man with an unclean spirit. So you know, what, you know what? Come on, come on. You know what the devil did? He sent one of his best agents. He sent one of his best agents and he says, I couldn't drown him in the sea, but now I'm going to get him on the land. Because I do not want Jesus in this Decapolis area. This is mine. Watch this. For years, the devil had this area all as his. And the same thing, my friend, with some of your lives. A lot of times the devil has your life and you've not claimed that from him. You have not done anything to rebuke Satan, to get out of your life, plead the blood of Jesus over this, and quit letting the devil make a havoc of your life. So the devil says, I can't get him on the sea, but I'll get him on the land. Look what he says. I'm going to send one of my best demons to him. Now, I'm going to show you something about this that might surprise you. Out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Look at the next verse. Who Now, watch this. Who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man, oh, I love this, could bind him. No, not with chains. Now, watch this. Look at, look at the next one. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. Fetters as those you put on your feet. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him. Wow, look at the strength this guy had. And the fetters broken in pieces, a lot more strength. Now watch this. Neither could any, quotation, man tame him. By the way, Jesus is no ordinary, ordinary man. Now, the story gets more interesting neither could any man tame him. Now, can I tell you this? So the devil brought out one of all of the, his prize to meet Jesus. <laughs> this area was controlled by Satan until Jesus got out of the boat. That's good, preacher. You can only imagine what Jesus was confronted with here. You see, the devil was unable to prevent Jesus from crossing the sea. And now look at verse number 5 in that same chapter. And always, look at this guy, night 
and day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Isn't that funny how the devil lies? You know what he says? You're tormenting me, Jesus. No, my friend, it's the other way around. Come out of this man, thou unclean spirit. Now, the power of darkness was evident. This man could not be tamed, or so they thought. They used man's ways and man's methods. Day and night, you could hear this man screaming. He was cutting himself. And can I tell you this? Watch this. Not only was this man screaming, I was going to do that. And if I made this scream, I thought I'd wake Jonathan up. I didn't want to do that. But the Bible says he was cutting himself with stones. So let's just paint a very broad picture. This man was highly disfigured here. He had to look horrible. Living like he did with chains and the calluses and, and, and all of the, the things he tried to bind this guy with. And he was continued cutting himself and screaming. And this is the guy that Jesus met as soon as he got off the boat. Or, 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 or we got this in our minds. Jesus didn't have a break. Have you ever entered one of those seasons in your life? It didn't seem like you get a break. It just seemed like after you get up, after one attack, then you get another and then another. And it just seems to keep following you. This is where Jesus was. Why? Because the Jesus was in satanic territory. This was, this was, this was Satan's domain. This was a place that Satan was proud of because it was corrupt. It was vile and it was nasty. And that's the places that Satan loves to dwell. Which leads me to this. Jesus is not afraid to go to the places that are vile, disgusting, and nasty. Why? Is because some of us were just like that. Before we met Jesus, there would be nobody that would have ever given you a chance. Before you met Jesus, you know what people said about you? They are a hopeless cause. Before you met Jesus, you know what people would say about you? They are absolutely pathetic. What on earth are they ever going to accomplish in their life? They have no value. Jesus can make value out of the disgusting and the refuge of this world. Aren't you glad about that? Because all of us can sympathize with this man. So the point I'm making is this guy looked pitiful. He looked, he, he looked, he looked deformed. Now, I want you to notice something because some of you will ask this question. Let me answer it for you right quick before I finish. The word worshiped in this rendering here does not mean true worship because demons are not in the practice of worshiping God. This was deceitful worship. And did you know that that sin, deceitful worship can show up in churches? Wow. The Bible records two of Jesus' visits to the capitalists. And you can be sure his disciples knew about this place and probably was not excited to go there, which should remind us this, the Lord can rescue sinners out of darkness. Now, let me try to point all, and, and pull all of this together, and then we'll be done. Look at Mark chapter 5, verse number 9. I'm trying to hurry. Watch. And he asked him, What is thy name? Jesus is speaking, and he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away of the, out of the country. And there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all of the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine. So you know the rest of that story. The man's name was Legion. And Legion in the Roman army consisted of between 3,000 and 6,000 soldiers. How many demons did this guy have? Very, very tormented And that's the reason why the devil sent this guy out. Because he wanted to get Jesus. Oh, I love this story. Mark 5, 15. And they came to Jesus. Watch, watch. Everybody watch. And they see him that was. Circle that word was. If you've been saved and redeemed by the blood of Christ, you are a was. Was possessed with the devil. And had legion sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. Wow. Wow, that's not what the devil figured. No, 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 no. Devil was going to bring Jesus down. Can I tell you, Jesus did a great work. Now, 
Let me show you this. Uh, uh, let me let me skip some stuff. Okay, I, I, I was going to show you something very interesting before I leave this section and and and, and we leave the day. I thought this was neat. I want to show you something. If you if if you can take just one more minute, Luke chapter fifteen verse thirteen. I want to pull this story together. Luke chapter fifteen verse number thirteen. Look what it says. And not many days after the younger son gathered together, excuse me, gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, everybody knows this story as the prodigal son. But I want you to understand something in this story that says the far country. Listen, that some far country, many suggest that this was none other than Decapolis. Certainly, the capitalist was distant in its values and its belief. It would be a place for wild living, and the place had plenty of pigs that needed to be fed. And it would only make a short distance for this prodigal to go back home to his uh, forgiving father. No one knows if the story of the prodigal son is in the country of the capitalist, but certainly the lifestyle certainly was. Now listen, it fits the story. Jesus' area of ministry to Galilee was close to the area of Decapolis, so there he went there to open the dark hearts. Let me finish by telling you this, and then I'm done. Do you understand now in Mark chapter 4 why that big storm came about? Because Jesus was going to a region that the devil did not want him to go to. He tried to censor him, tried to stop him. Jesus Rebuke the wind, and it ceased. Jesus went into this area of Decapolis, and this demon-possessed man with all of these demons in him. Legion was his name. The Bible says no man could tame him, but Jesus did. Why? It's because the devil did not want Jesus to go into a territory that he had sold up. Which leads me to this to you. The devil does not want Jesus to come into your life because he may think he has you sewed up. And let me tell you this this morning. Whether you're living in Decapolis or whether you're living in Muleshoe, Texas, you, my friend, need a relationship with God Almighty. These stories are now one of record that's pulled together for you. And I hope you can see what God was up to. Even when he went into the devil's territory, Jesus knew what he was going to face, but he stood there to defy Satan's territorial claims. And can I tell you something this morning that's exciting for you? Jesus can defy Satan's territorial claims on your life today. Today. Today, if you don't know anything else, get this and we're done. When I started seeing this and started pulling all of this information together, I thought, Jesus must love us a whole lot to go into a territory that no man wanted to go. Can I tell you, no man wanted to mess with Legion. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. Nobody really wanted to be on that boat with Jesus. That was abundantly clear. Jesus rebuked that storm and wind and Jesus went over to the capitalist and rebuked Satan's claim claim on that particular place. Listen to me this morning. If you're struggling in an area, if you do not know what to do, then my friend, it's time for you to stake out Jesus Christ and let Him put claim on your life. And let Him say, if I'm there, I'm not going to allow Satan to come into this area no more. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You have a rare opportunity this morning to do something special. You have a rare opportunity to allow God to be God and to come and clean up and do something special in your life. We may not be in Decapolis, but somebody here may not be too far from it. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have afforded to us this morning. Father, this is a de- this is a r- opportunity of a lifetime for somebody here that is struggling. 
For somebody here that is wasting their life and potential. For somebody here, Lord, that just needs God's power back on their life. And Father, you never know when we get to a service like this, what's in the hearts of people. I would pray, dear Lord, that in this moment, in this particular hour, in this session, most important part of our service is what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Christ? Are you going to just let the devil still have control of your life? Are you going to still let him have claim and ownership? Are you going to be like the people of Decapolis? Are you going to try to force Jesus out? Today would be a good day to get right with God. Today would be a good day to get your life back where it needs to be. Because I'm telling you, life is too short to be dealing with problems and situations in your heart. Today would be a good day to get clean. Today would be a good day to mark the territory for God once again. Some of you have drifted. Some of you are not as close to God as you used to be. Wouldn't it be great if the altars were full this morning? People would come and repent of their sins and get right with God once again. It would make the devil so mad if you would do that. But let's not worry about that. Let's worry about pleasing Christ. Father, for all of these in this room, I pray that you would do the work that you, you want done this morning. Father, don't, don't, don't let it be done on my words, but let it be done on your words. Father, I pray that people will open up their heart door of opportunity and invite Christ in to clean them up and to get them settled and get them back to where they need to be. Bring the joy back into their hearts. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me all over the room? Would you come and fulfill the purpose that God has for your life?